Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, it is Independence Day weekend, and uh, this coming Tuesday our nation celebrates, if my math is correct, its 241st birthday. Of course, the celebration of our nation's birth takes our minds not only to the various battles and, and wars that have been waged and other major events that have uh, served to, to form and shape us as a country, but it also gets us thinking about this whole topic called government. So what do you think? Is government a good thing or is it a bad thing? Well, let's take a look at the record. Government waste, pork barrel spending, gridlock, uncontrolled deficit spending, unmanageable bureaucracy, entitlement abuses, outright fraud in some cases, ethics violations, special interest groups, powerful lobbyists, higher taxes, illegal immigrants, health care, partisan bickering, and the list goes on and on. And if that isn't bad enough, the lack of civility in our political discourse today seems to have reached an all-time high. Certainly, one way to, what, spoil a dinner party or even end a friendship is to talk politics. Ah, but we must talk politics here today. Why? Well, because, believe it or not, God's Word has something to say about government and all the politics that come with government. And friends, what God's Word has to say about it all, well, it just might surprise you. You see, the Word of God that we're going to meditate upon here today is our epistle reading from Romans chapter 13. And you know, given the political climate that exists in our country today, you've got to admit, this is a pretty difficult text for us to deal with. Listen again to what God's Word says here. Romans chapter 13, verse 1, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Yes, you heard, you read that correctly. This thing called government that so often brings, wow, all kinds of emotion and debate is actually an institution that God himself created. Sort of shocking, isn't it? And you know, if that verse doesn't get your attention, then I guarantee you that verses 6 and 7 most certainly will. Picking it up there at verse 6, it says, for because of this, that is, because of this thing called government, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Needless to say, these are some very challenging words for us. So how do we make sense of all of this? Well, we can start by providing some context to Romans chapter 13. When the Apostle Paul wrote the words here of our text, you know, he was writing to the church there at Rome. And Rome, you see, well, it was, it was the Washington, D.C. of that day. At that time, the Roman government was, a, at best, at best, it was tolerant of the, the Christian movement. Actually, a, a few years after Paul had written his letter, 
the Roman government, under the reign of Emperor Nero, engaged in wholesale persecution of those who called themselves Christian. And yet, my friends, in the midst of what was clearly a less than ideal government, well, Paul was able to find some positive aspects to Roman rule. Like, for example, the fact that they provided safe travel on the roads and on the seas, which was actually very beneficial and important to Paul in carrying out his missionary journeys. Or the fact that they had, well, a fairly decent legal system, which, which Paul utilized from time to time. Well, my friends, in that same spirit, we too, we too have enjoyed many blessings from the government of which we live under, whether we agree with its policies or not. Like the Apostle Paul, we too can be thankful for things like an extensive transportation network that our government has established here in this nation, as well as a decent legal system. We can also credit our government for establishing a, a strong national defense, building our, our, our energy supply, improving public health and safety, and really the list of blessings, it just goes on and on. As a matter of fact, I came across an article here, 50 Ways Government Works for Us. I thought this was kind of interesting and, and uh, eye-opening. It says, for instance, the Department of Interior protects our national parks for the enjoyment of all Americans, many who are experiencing enjoying that this holiday weekend. It says public education available to every child. Inspection of meat, dairy, and food protects against contamination and disease. The U.S. Weather Service provides storms and, and hurricane warnings. Uh, the United States Army Corps of Engineers helps maintain the nation's ports, harbors, and navigation channels. Thanks to the Federal Aviation Administration in the United States, our air traffic control system is the safest in the world. And it, again, it goes on and on here. Needless to say, we do have much to be thankful for as a nation. And you know, as the people of God, well, let's not forget that this is the way our God often works in our lives. You see, God, for example, protects us, right? He does. But he often chooses to provide that protection through earthly agencies or means, like that of government. That is why we are instructed here in our reading to recognize that government is actually a part of God's good creation and that it exists for our well-being. Therefore, it is our duty and our obligation to submit to the governmental authority which God has allowed to exist, to support it with our taxes, and to give to those who are part of it proper honor and respect. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking here. Pastor, you might be thinking, you can't really be serious about all this. I mean, come on, look at some of the terrible things that government, including our own government, have sanctioned. And look, of course, to all the, the godless, the, the ruthless dictators around the world. Look at how government has become perhaps rightfully synonymous with terms like that of liar, cheater, swindler, swamp dweller, and a host of other derogatory terms. Clearly something is amiss here. Clearly something must be wrong with God's word when it comes to addressing this topic of government. By the way, have you ever noticed how when we encounter something here in Scripture that doesn't sit well with us, we tend to conclude that the problem lies not really with us, but with Scripture. 
think about it. We, we don't like what God's Word says about any given topic. You name it. Uh, we don't like what it says about abortion or um, how it defines marriage or, or gossip or the role of women, the role of men, the role of government, church attendance, whatever it may be. And so what do we do? We naturally conclude that God's Word is wrong on that matter. And our view, well, it's the right one. Friends, do you see how arrogant that is when we do that? What we're really doing when we do that is, is we're placing ourselves above God. It's like we're saying, God, you don't know what you're really talking about here. I know better than you do. And you know something, that pattern of, of elevating ourselves above God like that is really the oldest sin around. It can be traced all the way back to our first parents, Adam and Eve, there in the Garden of Eden when they figured that they knew better than God. And so ate from the tree of which they were told not to eat from. People do that, don't they? They disobey God like that. Well, you know what? The people who serve us in government are susceptible to doing that same thing. You see, when God's Word holds up government, as it does here in our reading, that doesn't mean that government is beyond reproach or that it hasn't at times fallen prey to huge and horrible abuses of power. No, sadly, like all the other things God has instituted for our good, things like marriage and family, church and the administration of God's word and sacraments. Sadly, well, government also has been misused and abused. And of course, the reason why that happens is, well, not because there's something wrong with the things God has instituted, but friends, because there's something wrong with us, human beings. You see, we're sinful human beings, right? And sinful human beings have a way of messing things up. In fact, you can count on it. So what are we to do when that happens? Well, individually, when we mess things up, when we sin, we are to repent. That is, we are to turn to God in sorrow over our sin and receive the forgiveness that he freely provides on, a, on account of Christ. And all that Christ has done for us through his life and death and his resurrection. Now, that's what we do as individuals. But how are we to respond to, say, an imperfect government? Well, thankfully for us here in the United States, we live in a country that allows us a certain amount of recourse. When things uh, get out of step with God's original intent... So in regards to government and politics, why we have, for instance, voting rights that we can exercise here in this country, and we really ought to do that. We also have the freedom of speech and can make our Christian values and views known by writing letters to our governmental officials as well as articles for our fellow citizens to read so that we might influence them to do what is right and just. Furthermore, the First Amendment of the Constitution grants the right of people to, to what? To peaceably assemble so that our collective voice as God's people can be magnified in this country. Yes, we are truly blessed to live in a nation where we possess such wonderful freedoms like that. However, at the same time, in a fallen world such as ours, the kinds of freedoms which we enjoy here in this country, well, they're not guaranteed to everyone in the world. As a matter of fact, most people in the world today do not have the kinds of freedoms we do. And why, even for us here in the United States, we may not always have the freedoms that we enjoy today. Heaven forbid if that were ever to happen. But, you know, these freedoms can be lost. Fact is, most people throughout world history, as well as in this present day, 
live under the tyranny and control of a, a government that is more like that which Paul lived under when he wrote his letter to the Romans, which probably explains why, why the thing we are told in the Bible to do most often as citizens is, well, no, it's not to vote or to write or to assemble, as important as those things may be, but the thing we are told to do most often as it relates with our interaction with the government around us is to pray for them. Yeah, pray for them. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Timothy, First of all, then, he says, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high position. In other words, the government. And why is our prayer for the government so important? Well, for starters, because those in government, hey, they very much need our prayers. Friends, imagine the responsibility our, our own governmental officials here in the United States have in governing the world's third largest nation and undoubtedly the world's most powerful and influential nation. That is no small task. They need our prayers. But even more importantly, prayer, if you think about it, is an act of submission. That is submission to him, who is the ultimate authority. You see, the Christian recognizes through, for instance, the act of prayer, that the one who is truly in control of all things, including governments, is God. I think the psalm writer summed it up well when he wrote, Do not put your trust in princes in mortal men who cannot save. For when their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. But the psalm writer goes on to say, Blessed is the one whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who remains faithful forever. May the eternal God, the one who remains faithful forever, continue to bless these United States of America and all nations and all governments of this earth. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.